Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the annual Classics Divinity Lecture, which is co sponsored this year by Jewish Studies. The expanding sponsorship being in itself a tribute to the versatility of our speaker of the day. Professor Eric Gruen is probably well known to most, if not all, of you. He came to this country, he was born in Austria, and came to this country in 1939, in the nick of time, one might say. Then he did degrees at Columbia and at Oxford, and completed his PhD at Harvard 50 years ago this year, I believe. He then taught for a few years at Harvard, and has been at Berkeley since 1966. He attempted to retire about seven years ago. But after that length of time, people found that difficult at Berkeley, and they persuaded him to come back, and to even to take on a little administration in the latter phase of his career. But now I gather he is trying to retire again, so we'll see if they finally let him be this time. Now, if you look over Eric's CV, you can see, you can distinguish a few phases in it. He made his reputation, and a good reputation, in Roman history. Books like The Hellenistic World and the Coming of Rome, and Culture and National Identity in Republican Rome. And then, in the mid-90s, he had a new vocation, one might say, and he turned his attention to Hellenistic Judaism and shook up the field fairly well uh, by presenting a picture of diaspora Jews as people who were confident in their self-identity and uh, approached life even with a sense of humor that people hadn't always appreciated. He himself, in the, in the second of his books of that phase, the first being Heritage and Hellenism, and then the second, Diaspora. In the preface of Diaspora, he acknowledged that some people might find his picture of Hellenistic Jews a little too sunny and optimistic. Uh, I recall one critic saying gently that he thought that Professor Gruen had fashioned the Hellenistic Jews in his own image and likeness, a self-confident, genial, and good-humored people, to which I believe Eric replied, guilty as charged. <laughs> After all, we all have heuristic models, and as a diaspora Jew himself, he should have some insight into the possibilities in that regard. In the latter phase of his career, he has expanded his range again over the whole Mediterranean world. The most important book, I suppose, in the last few years, Rethinking the Other in Antiquity, which is a great book, published in 2011, and a couple of edited volumes, Cultural Borrowings and Ethnic Appropriations in Antiquity, and Cultural Identity in the Ancient Mediterranean. But Eric's greatest achievement, probably, and contribution, is one that I wasn't aware of till I looked over his CV, where he says discreetly at the end of it that I have supervised or served on the dissertation committees of 89 students and is still serving on seven more. Maybe before he's finished, he'll get it up to the century. That is a staggering achievement. It has also been noted that he has transmitted some of his personality to some of these students. Somebody said to me once that he has peopled the world with genial, good humor people. And those of his students that I have met fit that description pretty well. So there is nobody I would rather welcome to give this lecture than Eric Gruen, who has put in a half century of wonderful contributions to this field. And he will speak to us tonight on Christians and Jews in, Neronia, in the Neronian era. Eric. Thank you very much, John. Uh, very hard to 
follow that up with anything halfway decent. I think the uh, sometimes has been said that when one gives a lecture, an invited lecture in another institution, there are lots of problems with that. You're always you're anxious, you're worried. Are you going to be fully prepared? Is it going to be a, uh, at all acceptable? Uh, will it bomb? Will anybody believe it? Uh, but the one thing that makes it worthwhile is to listen to the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I should tell you also that John was a speaker in a very prestigious series of three lectures at Berkeley a year or so ago, and I had the great pleasure of introducing him at one of those lectures. And I delivered a uh, lengthy encomium, making it very difficult for John to live up to the advance billing. And uh, although I, there were no exaggerations there, uh, it's impossible to exaggerate the qualities and the accomplishments of John Collins. Nevertheless, I made it as difficult for him as I could. And it, when he went up to the podium, he turned to me and he said, just wait till you come to Yale. I'm going to get back at you, <laughs> which he has now done. Uh, but I do appreciate it. And I have uh, had a wonderful uh, couple of days here. And I'm grateful to the uh, Yale Divinity School and the Classics Department and the Judaic Studies Program who have conspired to bring me here and have been most gracious and hospitable. And I hope not to disappoint them too greatly with this talk. Now, Paul, the learned Jew from Tarsus, got himself into trouble almost everywhere he went. And he went all over course. His peregrinations brought him to a multitude of places around the Mediterranean, and he delivered his controversial message and his uh, problematic mission to cities in Syria, Cyprus, Asia Minor, Greece, Macedonia. And Paul's final stop not an altogether voluntary one, was Rome. And the decision to go there was a memorable one, shall we say. It was in Rome that Paul spent his last years, or at least the last years of which we know anything. And after harsh treatment and accusations in Jerusalem, he had appealed to Caesar, evidently expecting or hoping at least for a sympathetic verdict. Whether it ever came remains a mystery. The question I'm asking is, should he have expected one? Did he anticipate a favorable verdict when he appealed to Caesar? In other words, what could a Jew have anticipated from the ruler of the known world? Now, the Roman emperor at the time of Paul was, of course, Nero, a man whose name continues to live in infamy. The sentence, or the verdict that was delivered, we are, we are still in the dark about. Had Paul deceived himself? Was this a mistake? Was his appeal to Caesar a clever ploy on his part, or was it a desperate and fruitless move? And what does that decision tell us about the status of Jews or a Jewish sect in Imperial Rome. 
Well, one approach to this question is, I think, and needs to be, an inquiry into Roman policy towards alien cults in general. That is, I think, vital background for this story. And it provides us with critical insight into the Roman disposition on this subject. Now, there's a fact of real significance that needs to be emphasized. Romans regularly imported external cults. They did so at the public level, making them part of the state apparatus. And they also welcomed them on the private level. And an increasing number of Romans became interested and became adherents of foreign rituals and foreign observances. That's one of the great virtues of polytheism. The practice of incorporating alien religions began already in Rome's earliest history, at least as tradition reports it to us. The worship of Heracles, for instance, came from Greece, um, according to legend, came from Greece to the site of Rome and did so early enough in time for Romulus himself to sacrifice to him. And then the summoning, the evocatio of Juno Regina from the great Etruscan city of Vi, which took place in 396 BCE, which allowed that goddess, so the tale tells us, to give victory to Rome in this allegedly 10 years war between the Romans and the people of Vi. So Juno Regina thereafter would be worshipped in Rome on the Aventine Hill where her own temple would forever be a reminder of divine favor for the Romans against their foes. Now whatever the historicity of those events, and I'm not claiming it of course, the attitude that's represented in the tradition reflects a uh, readiness to embrace principal foreign deities and to make them part of the Roman ritual. Now that process continued in uh, accelerated fashion in the Middle and Later Republic. Among the imported cults was that of Asclepius, the healing god from Epidaurus in 293 BCE. And then Venus Regina, uh, a, a mixed Greco-Phoenician goddess from western Sicily. Uh, she came in 217. And Magna Mater, the great mother from Anatolia, arrived in Rome in 205. Um, and in addition, there were others that entered the scene. These were all, uh, the ones that I mentioned were all through public uh, uh, acceptance, but others enter the scene through private embrace or individual adherence. Uh, the worship of Isis it serves as a conspicuous instance of widespread popularity, beginning, of course, in Egypt, but gradually meandering all over the Roman Empire, uh, including Rome itself. And Mithras, whose roots were Persian, but eventually found his way in large part through the armies, especially along the Rhine and the Danube, uh, to a variety of sites in the West. And in fact, a uh, whole range of deities migrated, spreading to Rome and to the Romans who lived elsewhere. Yes, Juvenal might sneer about the Orontes pouring its refuse into the Tiber. But worshipers in Roman Italy, whether foreigners or indigenous, did in fact practice a miscellany of uh, cults and rituals with little or no uh, repression, little or no persecution. The acceptance and the embrace of alien cults was simply a long-standing ingredient of the Roman identity. Now how do the Jews fit into this picture? Well, like other religious communities under the aegis of the uh, imperial power, 
they largely enjoyed the indifference of the authorities. In fact, they'd had a thriving community uh, in the city of Rome for at least 200 years before the arrival of Paul. A large portion of the Jews, as Philo tells us, lived across the Tiber, established their own communities, their own synagogues, carried on their traditional practices without obstruction from the Roman government. And we have documentary evidence from the Jewish catacombs in Rome which give us the names of 11 synagogues in the city, at least four of which probably date to the late Republic or to the early Empire, thereby uh, in existence by the time of Paul. So Rome comfortably incorporated Jews, indeed explicitly safeguarded their privileges within their pluralistic religious universe. Had things changed by the time of Nero? Well, the evidence is scarce. But there's a most interesting episode that sheds some unexpected light on this question. Josephus, in his Vita, reports a visit to Rome of, uh, of his own, a visit in which he, as a young man, having just completed, he said, his 26th year, which would put this trip in the year 63 or 64. In other words, very close to the time, maybe a few years after Paul's arrival in Rome as a prisoner waiting trial. And remarkably enough, Josephus' uh, mission was called forth by a somewhat comparable situation. Certain Jewish priests, he tells us, have been sent to Rome in bonds, in what Josephus calls a minor and trivial charge. They'd been sent to Rome to plead their case before Caesar. They'd been dispatched there by the prefect, the Roman prefect Antonius Felix, the very same man before whose tribunal in Caesarea Paul was accused and who held him there in custody for two years until he himself, Felix himself, was succeeded by the next Roman governor, Festus. And it was under Festus, as we know, that Paul uh, specifically uh, sought to go to Rome, chose to do this by appealing to Caesar. Now Josephus took ship also in the prefecture of Festus. He disembarked in Puteoli, made his way to Rome in order to seek the release of the Jewish prisoners who had been held there. Now these Jewish priests must have been held in custody in Rome for several years. The last part of Felix's prefecture and the early years of Festus's. And it's striking and perhaps suspicious that Josephus, like Paul, reached his destination only after severe storms, long delays, and a shipwreck. Josephus, however, as he tells us, gained success in his mission. He managed through friendship with a mime actor of uh, Jewish origin, who was a favorite of the emperor, through him, he gained access to Papia Sabina, the wife of the emperor. And through her good offices, says Josephus, he secured the release of the priests, acquired handsome gifts, and returned home. Now, that's quite an interesting narrative. Shipwreck stories, of course, were common in ancient literature, as we all know and makes it maybe a little suspicious, or at least part of the story. And it's certainly not easy to buy the idea that Josephus personally and solely 
managed to persuade Papia Sabina to release the captives directly into his hands. But at the least, uh, well, to be sure, there was, uh, we can suspect embellishment and exaggeration here. But in any event, the parallels with Paul's confinement in Rome do lend some plausibility to the circumstances that Josephus describes, especially as neither the author of Acts nor Josephus shows any awareness of the other's narrative. But in both cases, the Roman prefect of Judea, Felix in the case of the priests, Festus in the case of Paul, sent Jewish prisoners to Rome to be heard by the Emperor Nero. And in both cases, the prisoners were held in custody, in custody for a matter of years. And in neither case, so far as we know, did Nero actually hold a hearing. Well, can we infer anything from this with regard to official Roman attitudes or policies towards Jews in the reign of Nero? Not a lot, unfortunately, but the reluctance of Roman authorities in Judea to render decisions on delicate and complicated uh, religious issues, that does seem clear. The referral to Caesar in both instances relieved the prefects of the burden of deciding controversial cases. And Nero was obviously in no hurry to hear these cases at his tribunal. Paul stayed for two years in Rome, according to the Book of Acts, welcoming all who wanted to see him, providing uh, his own counsel freely and unhindered by the authorities. What happened to him after those two years does not repay speculation, although there has been plenty of speculation on that subject. But there is no evidence and, to my mind, very little likelihood that Nero ever heard the case. In all probability, the emperor was completely indifferent to a uh, sectarian quarrel within an alien religion like Judaism. What charges were leveled against the Jewish priests remains completely elusive to us. But their untroubled release, that is revealing. Josephus indicates that Papia Sabina uh, and her intervention alone secured the freeing of the prisoners. Circumstances of that sort obviously do not suggest that there was any official repression taking place, rather that the government was largely uninterested in the fate of the Jews. Now to reconstruct the atmosphere for Jews generally in Neronian Rome is not an easy task. How much can we gain, for instance, from the comments of contemporary Romans about that peculiar religion and its practitioners? Well, the surviving remarks by Romans on Jews are piecemeal and they are scattered, and they offer very little in the way of a persistent pattern. And I would say they are often accorded much more weight than they deserve. Yes, scholars have dutifully gathered all of the relevant remarks in an assemblage that seems on the face of it significant. I mean, the, the great collection of, uh, of uh, remarks by Greek and Roman authors on the Jews that was done by Menachem Stern is an absolutely invaluable resource without question. But 
when you compare those remarks to the total corpora of the writers in which those uh, comments are to be found, they are pitifully few. Roman intellectuals simply did not spend a great deal of time thinking or writing about Jews. In fact, the overwhelming impression of the attitude towards Jews who lived in Rome is essentially one of indifference. <clears throat> Jewish customs, of course, gave rise to some mockery, to some parody, yes. But the Jews simply had too little importance to provoke the, uh, the authorities to any sort of repression or harassment even. On the other hand, the repeated references by pagan writers to things like circumcision, to the Sabbath, to dietary restrictions, these themselves are quite revealing in a very different sense. Namely, they demonstrate that the Jews did not hide away in isolated ghettos, shunning the gaze of Roman society. They dwelled in readily identifiable communities. They made no secret of their characteristic customs. With very few exceptions, the Jews in Rome lived undisturbed by the authorities. They didn't require protection or promotion by the regime, nor did they expect tolerance. I avoid the term tolerance, which I think is simply uh, inappropriate for attitudes in antiquity. What they got was largely disregard and uh, unconcern. And that sufficed. Now, you might very well want to raise a serious objection to this picture I've just been painting. Is it not the case that only a few years before Nero ascended to the throne, his predecessor, the Emperor Claudius, in the year 49, expelled Jews from Rome, allegedly on the grounds of their repeated upheavals prompted by a certain Crestus. Such at least is the notorious account that's supplied to us by the imperial biographer Suetonius in his life of Nero, or sorry, life of Claudius. Now Suetonius may not have gotten it quite right, but he didn't make it up either, not altogether. Because Paul himself, as we're told in the book of Acts, encountered two of the victims of that expulsion by Claudius. When the apostle went to Corinth, he came across the Jew Aquila and his wife Prisca, who had recently come from Italy as consequence of Claudius' decree that all Jews depart from Rome. Well, does this not cast a dark shadow on imperial policy towards Jews? Does this not suggest animosity and oppression? And would this not have affected Paul's own perception of what he might anticipate when he got to Rome? Well, the matter is not quite so straightforward as that. First of all, the expulsion could hardly have been thorough. Um, could hardly have been a sweep of all or even most Jews. Jews, we're told, had increased substantially in numbers in uh, recent years. So that to implement a wholesale uh, deportation would have been a formidable task. Surely, from the Roman point of view, not worth the effort, the time, and the expense now, there had been an expulsion order under Tiberius 30 years earlier. It's not necessary here to uh, re-examine that much-examined 
episode, but what requires notice simply is that the departure of Jews at the time of Tiberius could not have been extensive because they were back in Rome or perhaps for the most part never left before Claudius took the throne. Tiberius had evidently refrained from a, a serious implementation of this expulsion order. Uh, it was largely, in my view, a symbolic gesture to exhibit the emperor's religious piety in the wake of reports of divine displeasure uh, regarding the um, death of his very popular son, adopted son, Germanicus. And much the same, I think, will have held for Claudius and his decree of 49. We know that the emperor's uh, object, uh, well, I would suggest that the emperor's objectives parallel those of Tiberius here because we know that Claudius presented himself as a guardian of ancient Roman rituals. Among other things, this allowed him to contrast himself with the uh, madcap antics of Caligula who had regularly uh, mocked the homage that was paid to the gods by his uh, countrymen. Uh, we know of a, a string of measures and actions by Claudius that were designed to advertise his devotion to traditional Roman religion and to uh, uh, the, have that mark a central feature of his reign. Uh, Claudius Claudius' action in this case took place, some of these uh, religious actions on his part took place in this very year of 49 where he formally extended the pomerium, the uh, <coughs> sacred boundary of the city, uh, which signified a, a corresponding increase in the borders of the Roman Empire, and it required the revival of an archaic ritual which had only rarely been performed in the past. Uh, and that event came in close conjunction with another one, the uh, reinstitution of the uh, Salutis Augurium, that is the uh, solemn augury for the welfare of the state, which was a, a ceremony uh, that had not been performed until Claudius uh, for more than a quarter of a century and was now to be set on a permanent footing in Rome by that emperor. And in that very same year, after the uh, suicide of Claudius's uh, prospective son-in-law, who had been accused of incest and had been removed from high office, the emperor ordered expiatory sacrifices, a type of sacrifice that dated back to the time of the Roman kings, six centuries earlier. And so again, this was a dramatic show of, the, uh, of, of Claudius' command of ancient religious traditions and practices. Now, as part of this display of his uh, uh, ancient piety towards the nation's gods, Claudius also singled out certain sects that didn't go with the program. He abolished, for instance, the religion of Druidism among the Gauls. He also prompted the Roman Senate to ban astrologers from Italy. And as Tacitus sardonically remarks, but quite rightly remarks, with regard to the astrologers in any case, that this decree was entirely unenforceable. And I think the same can readily be said of the measure against the Jews in the same year of 49. It came not only in the same year as the expulsion of the astrologers, but also the extension of the pomerium, the revival of the uh, salutis augurium, and the resort to expiatory sacrifices that could be um, traced back to the royal period of hoary antiquity by this time. Now, we needn't doubt the genuine religiosity of the emperor, but the actions serve primarily as symbolism and as uh, public relations, we might say. In the context, the expulsion decree was a, uh, we might say, a companion exercise to exhibit Claudius's uh, 
uh, devotions by removing or at least acting against, publicly acting against an alien cult. Uh, one should hardly imagine, however, a mass migration of Jews, let alone an enduring one. When Paul arrived in Rome about a decade later, Jewish communities in the city were evidently flourishing. As the Book of Acts reports, Paul summoned to him principal figures from the Jewish community in Rome, probably leaders from the several synagogues. A first group arrived shortly, and then a second one came later in large numbers, we are told. So there was no dearth of Jews in Rome. Claudius had not sought to root out the synagogues or to create a host of exiles. Now, what light, if any, does this expulsion shed on relations between the Jewish and the Christian communities in Rome? Were the Jews embroiled in conflict with this rival sect, thereby leading the Roman authorities to act against them? Well, the evidence, as usual, is frustratingly flimsy. And much attention, as many of you know, has been focused on Suetonius's tantalizing reference to the instigation of Jewish turbulence by a certain Crestus. On this matter, I'm going to be mercifully brief. In my view, it is most unlikely that Suetonius alludes here to Jesus Christ. The name Crestus is widely attested. It's a common designation in Rome, not only for freedmen or ex-slaves, but also for foreigners from the East generally, even second-generation Romans who held the name and second generation and beyond second generation. Indeed, some of them held office in Rome. Suetonius's passage with its impulsore cresto, presumes the presence of the instigator in Rome itself during the reign of Claudius. And that, of course, would rule out Jesus both chronologically and geographically. And the biographer's report here um, is on any count an exaggeration. His assertion that the Jews were repeatedly engaged in upheavals, eudaios assidue tumultuantes. That is simply uh, unsupportable. The secretary to the emperor Hadrian, Suetonius, of course, composed this work after Rome itself had experienced two major Jewish rebellions against Roman authority, the great revolt of 66 to 70, and the um, uh, uprising of Bar Kokhba under Hadrian himself, not to mention the diaspora revolts under Trajan. But, and those revolts could very well have induced Suetonius to talk about Jews as persistently troublesome and creating upheavals. But those upheavals had not yet happened by the time of Claudius. And no such Roman, uh, no such Jewish um, activity is recorded at any time prior to this in the city of Rome itself. So, Suetonius was confused. But despite the confusion of his testimony, many scholars have used it to argue that there lurks behind this, somehow or other, an allusion to, to Christian activity in Rome. That the tumult that prompted Claudius' decree in 49 on this view resulted from Christian missionary preaching in the synagogues, stirring up passions, generating Jewish resistance, and producing clashes between the sects. But there has been far, there is far too much uncertainty 
and certainly too much speculation that lies behind these hypothetical constructions. Had there been intense and uh, disorderly encounters between Christians and Jews in Rome in the reign of Claudius, it would be hard to understand the rather mild and somewhat detached comments of the Jews who visited Paul in Rome and who, according to Acts, said only that they had heard widespread criticism of that sect and they wanted to learn more about it from Paul himself. Would he tell them? Now, that casts serious doubt on the idea of conflicts between Jews and Christians in Rome, conflicts which the author of Acts, uh, those kinds of conflicts the author of Acts regularly records for other uh, regions, a virtual leitmotif of his presentation, but not for Rome. Now, of course, none of this rules out the presence of Christians in Rome in the Claudian years. Paul's letter to the Romans written early in the reign of Nero, indicates that he had waited for many years to uh, visit the Christian community in Rome. Christians were obviously there when Paul arrived only a few years after the death of Claudius and after the ascension of Nero to the throne. A number of them made a point of greeting the apostle, offering him welcome and hospitality right from the start of his arrival in Italy, even before coming to Rome. Uh, actual relations between Christians and Jews during the reign of Nero, of course, remains obscure. But one might notice that if serious conflict uh, existed between Jewish and Christian communities in Rome, there's not a hint of it in Paul's letter to the Romans. The work is remarkably irenic. This is one of his most striking characteristics. Christians, Jews, and pagans are all, whether real or constructed, addressees of the epistle to the Romans. But more importantly, Paul does not pit them against one another. The apostle reiterates frequently the assertion that God concerns himself with both Jew and Greek. This is a major motif of the letter. And harmony and concord are what is stressed. And Christ, he says, was a servant to the circumcised to fulfill the promise of the scriptures and to the Gentiles to glorify God. In fact, the uh, salvation of the Jews, he says, will come only when the Gentiles enter in full measure. It's the combination that stands at the center of that letter, which is rather different from the polemic that you get in uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians or the vigorous resistance by many Jews to Paul's uh, mission in the Near East. Now, how far this actually reflects relations in Rome and circumstances in Rome itself, we cannot know for sure. But it is at least consistent with the conclusion of the book of Acts that has Rome's Christian community welcome Paul and the Jewish leadership come peaceably to his dwelling to learn more about his sect. Now scholarly disputes continue, of course, about whether Christians in Rome in this time drew their numbers largely from Jews or from Gentiles. To my mind, this misses the main point. It's well to remember that Roman Christianity in the 50s CE would have been little more than a fledgling operation. The Jews themselves had no single unified community, uh, but uh, formed community, uh, formed uh, <coughs> excuse me, associations in a number of different synagogues. Some pagans also attached themselves to one or another of these communities, persons we normally identify as God-fearers, which of course was not an official designation, uh, but it was a characterization of those who adopted certain Jewish practices and rituals while refraining from full conversion. They shouldn't be understood, these God-fearers, as um, 
sort of on the, uh, existing on the margins of the synagogue, but rather as partaking in various forms and to various degrees in Jewish worship and behavior while retaining an independent sense of identity. Christian relationship to the synagogue, I think, would not have been very different. The terms that are often employed by moderns and that are seen as fundamental contrasts, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, really oversimplify this situation. Because in this period, Christianity was only beginning to attract adherents in Rome, and Christian communities were barely emerging. Uh, the uh, Jewish synagogues, as ways of life, appealed to a variety of non-Jews, proselytes, so-called God-fearers, and Christians alike. And it would be wrong to, uh, uh, to infer that there were firm lines drawn between and among these groups. It was fluidity that prevailed in this period of religious activity. Moreover, the formative period, which this was, must have witnessed considerable movement back and forth in both Jewish and Christian communities. Not so much conversion as, I would suggest, experimentation. In an era of such fluidity, it would be a mistake to imagine well-defined and discrete groups in a state of tension repeatedly and conflict with one another. The conclusion of the Acts of the Apostles suggests the absence of sectarian strife in Rome. The Christians greet Paul warmly on his arrival and the Jews willingly assent to his request that he meet with them in his quarters. To the Roman authorities, fine distinctions among Jews, proselytes, God-fearers, Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians, insofar as they existed at all, would have been quite opaque and a matter of complete indifference. When Claudius promulgated his decree of expulsion for the Jews, it could very well have encompassed Christians as well, not because the regime targeted them, but because their Roman officialdom didn't know or couldn't care about the difference. Claudius' decree aimed at adherence to the synagogue. Jews, Gentiles, proselytes, converts, Christians alike. His enforcers would not have taken the time and trouble to look closely at individuals' re uh, religious affiliation. They didn't check their IDs. If Claudius' act, as I think, was largely symbolic, there's no need to envisage a massive exodus, let alone a massive return thereafter, as is so often imagined. The, now, this confluence of groups must have spilled over into the reign of Nero. Roman authorities had uh, little reason to scrutinize what was, to them, minor differences in uh, beliefs and practices among these sects. And if Claudius's expulsion decree um, could encompass as I think it did, a range of participants in synagogue activities, not strictly speaking, Jews alone. Nero's actions against Christians may also have had more than a narrowly defined set of victims. On the uh, early years, on the face of it at least, the early years of Nero posed no threat to the Jews. General Roman indifference to alien cults, notwithstanding the brief demonstration under Claudius, still prevailed, I think. Nothing suggests any problems for, let alone oppression of Jews under Nero in those early years. And yet we run into a problem here. One that hasn't really been addressed. <clears throat> 
And that is that what little evidence we do possess on Jewish attitudes towards Nero indicates animosity and hostility. And that point deserves emphasis. If there was indifference to Jews, as I've been trying to argue, what accounts for that hostility on the part of Jews against Nero? Because it was there. Josephus, writing a decade or so after Nero's death, illustrates the animosity. Uh, the historian professes to uh, take an objective and detached position on Nero. In fact, he sharply criticizes other writers who portray Nero with shameless bias, as he calls it, whereas Josephus, for his part, claims uh, to take the high road and to speak only the truth. Not an uncommon representation by ancient historians. And he adds further that he will devote very little space to Nero himself. After all, his subject is the Jews, not the Roman emperors. But this show of objectivity is notably compromised by Josephus' declaration of what he will not write about. He asserts in the Bellum Judaicum that he will not discuss how Nero irrationally defied fortune through excess of prosperity and wealth that drove him to eliminate his brother, his wife, and his mother. He will pass over Nero's cruelty that he exercised against the most eminent members of Roman society, and he will omit the emperor's notorious and demeaning infatuation with the liar and the stage. Well, this uh, praetoritio by Josephus plainly lifts the mask of objectivity. He wouldn't write on these matters, but he's already paraded the vices of the emperor. And other comments on Nero, although uh, more indirect and maybe more restrained, nevertheless le leave little doubt of Josephus' opinion. When the Jewish rebellion broke out in 66, Josephus has very little to say about Nero's reaction, but what he does say is quite telling. In his account, the emperor put on a public posture of disdain and annoyance, but was inwardly shaken with panic and fear. Now, Josephus, of course, could not possibly know this. That he asserted it into his narrative is not exactly innocent. In discussing the death of Nero, Josephus reverts then to his uh, posture as a disinterested party. He will not report, so he says, how the emperor misused his rule by setting evil ministers in power the most useless of ex-slaves who plotted against him and who was then abandoned by all of his uh, guards had to flee the city and committed suicide in the suburbs. Josephus declares his intent to omit all of this. Of course, he had already recorded it and had left the desired impression. The Jewish historian makes it perfectly clear that he had no love for Nero. The scattered references with their transparent pretense of objectivity add up to a firmly adverse judgment. Now, a very different Jewish source or set of sources delivers a firmly hostile assessment of that emperor. The Sibylline Oracles constitute, as many of you know, a collection of fascinating but frustrating texts whose composition ranges, ranges over a period of centuries, some of them Jewish, some of them Christian, a few even pagan. And the authors of the uh, relevant passages on Nero provide an intriguing glimpse into attributes um, of that emperor, uh, an interesting glimpse into at least the attitudes within certain Jewish circles. They depict the emperor in dark terms. They record his failings, his crimes, his transgressions. Nero's notorious murder of his mother, for instance, captured public imagination. And allusions to him in the Sibylline Oracles as a matricide crop up frequently. In fact, it's a kind of repeated refrain 
almost an identifying label whenever Nero is mentioned, although the name Nero does not appear in proper oracular fashion. And furthermore, the texts commonly characterize Nero as having fled ignominiously from Rome and in his final days, a desperate escape route for the deposed and frightened ruler. And worse still, the emperor's um, hubris reached the point of pretensions to divinity. The fifth Sibyl ascribes, uh, ascribes to some at least the claim that Nero was the son of Zeus and Hera, a claim that the um, oracle sets beside a list of his misdemeanors and of the uh, disasters that he perpetrated upon the world. And furthermore, the text minces no words in condemning Nero, the matricide who flees from the ends of the earth with dastardly schemes to destroy every land that he conquers, to uh, annihilate rulers and subjects alike, to set all ablaze as none before him had ever done. In fact, among the peoples who would fall victim, according to the oracle, uh, victim to his uh, indiscriminate slaughters, would be none other than the nation of the Hebrews. Now, why this need to blacken Nero at every turn? What accounts for a Jewish impulse to label and relabel Nero as matricide, hebristic claimant on divinity, destroyer of cities and nations, and ludicrous lyricist? What had Nero ever done to the Jews? Well, an event of high notoriety occurred in Rome during the reign of Nero, as you know. The great fire of 64 CE that spread through much of the city. Many claimed that Nero himself had, was to blame for setting the fire. And in Tacitus's famous account, the emperor shifted the blame to Christians in order to get himself off the hook. And it is not, I think, coincidental that the strong reaction came in the wake of a conflagration that consumed numerous temples in Rome, a sign of divine displeasure that required elaborate expiation to a whole array of deities. This lashing out against a foreign sect in order to reestablish concordia with the gods, this was an act of appeasement to divine powers, comparable, I think, to the expulsion decrees of Tiberius and Claudius. Nero, as we know, ordered a grisly persecution of Christians, the first of its kind. Punishments were dire and dreadful. Convicted Christians were covered with animal skins, torn apart by wild dogs, nailed to crosses, where they were burned to serve as human torches in order to light up the city. Few who witnessed the scene of that sort could have failed to remember it or pass it on to descendants as a memorable episode. Now the sources tell us explicitly that the victims were Christians. No mention is made of Jews. But how easy would it have been for Romans in 64 CE to distinguish a Christian from a Jew? And how much would they have cared to do so? If, as I think likely, many Christians would have been affected by Claudius' decree to expel Jews, it is hardly less likely that many Jews were among the victims of Nero's search for scapegoats among the Christians. The authorities who were charged with rounding up the supposed perpetrators would not have been particularly scrupulous in making fine distinctions of this sort. And in this very early period when Christianity was barely emerging in Rome, there was shifting among sects and allegiances which was quite common. Now Tacitus, to be sure, 
knew the difference between Jews and Christians. But Tacitus wrote his annals nearly a half century after the great fire in Rome. And the historian tells us that there was a vast multitude of Christians whom Nero fingered as scapegoats for the fire. Now, was there really a vast multitude of Christians in Rome in the 60s? And even if they could be identified as such, would Roman officials really draw the difference and, or know the difference <coughs> between Jews and Christians, let alone among proselytes, God-fearers, Jewish Christians, and Gentile Christians? And would they take the trouble to find out? Well, there's one text that is worth noting in this connection. The pseudonymous correspondence between Seneca and Paul which mentions explicitly that Jews, as well as Christians, were punished for their part in the fire. Now that letter, of course, is late and fabricated. It's not a source for any confident historical reconstruction. But the association of Jews and Christians in this episode, even if it were invented, shows that at least one strand in the tradition found that combination to be plausible. Now, the idea that Jews suffered in the persecutions under Nero has never had any traction in the scholarship. Because there's been a weighty argument from silence that stands against it, namely the absence of any reference to Jewish victimization in Josephus. Surely, it's been argued, Josephus would have mentioned it if Jews had been victims well, not necessarily. One should note that Josephus had almost nothing to say about any events in Rome during the reign of Nero, nor that of Claudius before him, apart from the actual accession of Claudius to the throne. And that's particularly noteworthy with regard to Claudius' reign because of his expulsion order, which we have in several sources, but it goes unmentioned by Josephus. So the silence of the Jewish historian is, to my mind, quite indecisive. And the vast multitude of victims of whom Tacitus speaks must have included a substantial portion of Jews or Jewish converts to Christianity at the least. There simply weren't enough Christians around to constitute a vast multitude. The frightful deaths of individuals, even if not limited to Judaism itself, and even if not linked to Judaism itself, the deaths of those individuals could hardly have failed to leave a deep impression on the memories of those Jewish families and communities in Rome passed on to their subsequent generations. And they may well have played a role in Jewish blackening of an emperor who had otherwise done them no disservice as a people. And an echo that still lingers on in the Sibyl's puzzling reference to Nero's uh, determination to uh, assault various peoples, including the ethnos of the Hebrews. So, to summarize Let me refer to the original question that I asked. What was the atmosphere for Jews and Christians in Neronian Rome? What might Paul have anticipated when he chose to appeal to the emperor and to present his case before the imperial tribunal? Well, the survey, a very brief survey that I gave of Roman policy towards alien cults historically shows that policy to be inclusive and encompassing. And that attitude, despite common belief, I think, held also with regard to the Jews. 
The Roman intellectuals who commented on Jews were often dismissive. They often treated their customs and habits with uh, amusement or mockery, but they certainly conducted no systematic campaign of vilification or anything like it. Jews suffered neither oppression nor persecution. In general, the authorities were indifferent. In general, they were unconcerned. The only ostensible exceptions, as I tried to argue, the expulsion decrees, first under Tiberius and then under Claudius, were short-lived, largely unenforced, and affected only a small number. The decrees constituted demonstrations of religious devotion by the emperors. They were symbolic acts rather than serious measures of repression. Nor do we have any record of open conflict between Jews and Christians that might have uh, in Rome, that might have uh, bedeviled Rome, uh, Paul's stay in Rome, or might have provoked any Roman repression. Paul's letter to the Romans is fundamentally a pacific one, and the Acts of the Apostles betray no strain in the relationship when Paul reaches Rome. The dichotomy of Jews and Christians, or indeed of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, oversimplifies what was a much more complex, shifting religious scene that involved converts, God-fearers, and pagans of various sorts, many of them experimenting rather than committing. Christianity was still an embryonic state, hardly a fixed sect or structure. Adaptability should be emphasized, not struggles between established systems of belief. Paul, I think, would not have expected state repression. Nothing in Nero's reign to that point would have suggested it. Indeed, the untroubled release of Jewish priests by Nero's wife into the hands of Josephus exemplifies this sort of laissez-faire attitude on the part of the throne. The animosity towards the emperor that surfaced in Jewish writings, like Josephus and the Sibylline Oracles, came later. And I would suggest it is connected to Nero's frantic search for scapegoats in the aftermath of the fire of 64 for which he had to appease the gods. In short, the atmosphere in Neronian Rome would have lent Paul some confidence in an appeal to Caesar. The long record of Roman willingness to incorporate alien cults would offer him reassurance and the flexibility of religious experimentation would even have given him reason to expect some success in his mission. Under the circumstances, it must have seemed a good bet. Thank you very much.